Hi, I'm Martin, and welcome to the latest Pop Bucket podcast. With me today is James. Oh yeah. And Michael. Hello. It's Nazar with us today. She's off gallivanting on holiday, so it's just the boys. Yeah, they can have to deal with our masculine gruff tones for the day. <laughs> All our lucky lady listeners will be uh, swooning, no doubt. <laughs> as they listen to on their po- uh, iPods or like, PCs. So, uh, uh, anyway, uh, I've been away the last few weeks myself, so uh, what have you guys been up to? Anything well, good? I bought, uh, I think while you were away, yeah, it was while you were away, I bought a 3DS, um, which is my first foray into Nintendo consoles for quite a few years. It's a very good decision you've made there, James. Yeah, I'm beginning to think so myself, actually. I sort of, I did a bit of research, and I was thinking, it's either PS Vita or 3DS, and I used to have a PSP, so I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mix it up a bit. I'm going to go back to back to good old Nintendo. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I'm really enjoying it so far. I've only got a couple of things going on, so I've got Monster Hunter, which is really good. What um, games did you decide to get with the, uh, the console? Uh, Monster Hunter 3 mm. Ultimate. Which is bloody good. I've you know, killed quite a few hours on that so far. <laughs> um, uh, what else did I get? Oh, one of the old Professor Layton's, which I hadn't played, which is, I think it's Pandora's Box. That's the second one, yeah. That's the second one, yeah. Because I've started <laughs> playing the third one now. Oh, right. Yeah. What one's that? Lost Future or Forgotten Future or something like that. I can't remember yeah. at the moment. They're all really good, actually. They're, they're consistently good. I think I'll mm. probably get the new one um, sometime in the near future. Um, so yeah, I'm really enjoying it so far. Actually, it's a it's a nice little console. It's a massive upgrade as well since the last DS, um, which we have somewhere knocking about. I assume you got the the 3DS XL then. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's huge compared to uh, the other it ones, is. aren't there? It is. I was looking at because we've got the. The DS Lite, when it first first came out, it was about six years ago or whatever it was, and um, the comparison is just uh, just astounding, really. Not just the graphical capabilities, but the actual yeah, the sh- sheer screen size is uh, it's a nice little uh, upgrade. Hmm. How much bigger is is the screen on the 3DS? I think it's, they said it's ninety percent bigger, but I I don't know how they work that out really. It's, it's oh. probably double the size, isn't it, Martin? It is, it is yeah, nearly double the size. But uh, I don't. Yeah, the Vita's got a big size as well, but obviously the dual screen nature of the uh, 3DS makes it quite a bit sizable. Mm. Because obviously all the inventory and stuff's at the bottom, so it's sort of the top half of the screen where the gameplay takes place. Yeah, sort of frees up more space. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, I should say my my main incentive for buying the 3DS really was just so I could play um, Zelda Ocarina of Time again. <laughs> <laughs> I thought yeah. you were going to say, like Marty, is, is so I could play stuff in the bath. <laughs> that's what Marty normally says. Every well, hand well, yeah. console, <laughs> I haven't the, done the, it in the bath yet, but uh, yeah. Play, that's the standard test. That's the acid test. Team, it? <laughs> Playing Super Mario 3D Land in the bath is a, is a joy. Yeah. With your, with your glass of rum to that, hand. That's why you need to get, yeah. that's you why you need to get the That's why you need to get the Wii U as well, because then you can play Assassin's Creed 3 in the bath or need to be most wanted or. Waterproofing kit for the 3DS. But for clumsy fools. Well, if you, if one, someone, for example, is, bag or isn't it? <laughs> yeah, if one has a, gl- a bottle of rum in one hand and a 3DS in the other, I can see some mishaps in chewing. So I, I, I would like to. I'm, yeah. I'm sure there must be a free. Someone must have done a 3DS waterproof kit by now. Sure. It seems it seems a logical thing to do. No, it doesn't. I was thinking that about my iPad. Sorry. Like it would be nice to have a three a, a waterproof iPad when I'm in the bath. I think I have seen people. They've done. I have seen that waterproof uh, iPad cases before. Really? Um, yeah, I've seen. Um, you can sort of go swimming uh, with them, and you know, invite muggers to, to drown you. Um, yeah. But no, it, it, it looks. Uh, it looks like a really uh, sort of like you know, you get those hard case things mm. for iPods. It's a bit like that, but it's just obviously it's watertight as well, and yeah. got, comes with its own special it, headphones, like, like a waterproof thing for her camera it was like it was just like a, a fancy bag with sort of a clear kind of portal so you could kind of take photos through it but mm. yeah honest, i wouldn't fancy t- unless it's a really official uh yeah. piece of kit i wouldn't even really take it if i had an <laughs> ipad in the water if i had a, yeah. uh, in a swimming uh, pool with 3ds near a pool makes me uneasy you yeah. don't you don't really want that going wrong um 
any, especially not in a in in the bath or in a public pool. It's uh, it's kind of a bit of a risk. Yeah, yeah. it's a little bit. <laughs> well, I haven't been swimming recently, but I have been um, swimming in the delightful DLC. <laughs> look at that for a, look at that for a link. It's almost seamless of <laughs> Borderlands Two. <tea. laughs> um, because I got a, a, a season pass to review um, Tiny Tina, uh, the DLC, which is kind of like a, a sort of Mickey take of um, tabletop gaming, sort of uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Mm. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's really probably, it puts the fun back into Borderlands, really, because I, I felt the main campaign was a bit of a slog on uh, Borderlands at times. I mean, it had nice moments of humour and stuff, but like there were, there were points when I felt like, Oh, I'm just doing this to get through the game, um, mm. but the Tiny Tina DLC is is a is a joy to play from start to finish. It really is, and it's um, I played it with a couple of mates, and uh, it really is fantastic. They were they were like hardcore, and they were pointing out all the references. Look, that's a reference to Dark Souls. That's a reference to Dragon Age. Look at that mm. as we were going through. So it's, oh, even cool. if you don't get mm, even if you don't get all the references, it's still uh, a really solid sort of campaign. It's got some tough enemies. And uh, yeah, I'd recommend it. And also, I've been reviewing, well, reviewing, uh, playing through the Deadpool game, which I've very much been enjoying. So, um, via the magic of, of podcasting, when this goes up, hopefully there'll be a review, depending on how uh, studious I've been in um, <laughs> sorting it out. Basically, whether I've pulled my finger out or not. But we'll see. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's uh, pretty much what I've been up to. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's I cool. did a review for um, 3DS download game. Um, I think it's only available on the Nintendo eShop, but um, it's called Bugs vs. Tanks, which you may have seen floating about. Um, it's, uh, they had a version previously, but it's been ported to the 3DS now. Good title. That, yeah, it's a good title, actually. Mm. I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. There's not much to it in the way of storyline. It's kind of... Uh, Bugs vs. Tanks. Yeah, you see some like some some archive footage of World War Two and uh, a German Panzer squad that goes missing, and they're like, "Where's it gone? Where's it gone?" <laughs> oh, it's been shrunken, and uh, yeah, it ends up sort of on the battlefield, but about a hundredth of the original size. So they're sort of it's a bit like micro machines. You're all these tiny little tanks, <laughs> brilliant, <laughs> waging war on ants and wasps and spiders and all sorts of things that are trying to trying to have you for breakfast, but. Um, yeah, it's really good. It's got some some really funny kind of voiceovers. So every time you kind of fire an artillery type strike, you get the German general goes Panzer Four, <laughs> <laughs> and then all this kind of yeah hellfire just rains down on your enemies. But yeah, it's it's quite good. It's 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 deeper than you'd have thought. Actually, um, mm. it looks quite simplistic, but there's actually a lot that you can do in terms of customizing your tank, changing the type of ammunition and. You know, even giving it sort of your tank wacky paint jobs like um, yeah. tiger stripes and things like that. So it's quite pimp my tank, no. pimp your tank exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's good. It's kept me kind of quite occupied for a couple of hours. So yeah, the reviews up now. Um, I think I gave it an eight. In fact, I know I gave it an eight. You said like when they fought bugs and stuff, wasn't it in Red Alert, the original Red Alert? You mm. can fight yeah. ants. Ants, yeah. That was yeah. the um, bonus. Yeah bonus mission yeah um, yeah it was wasn't it it reminded like me of... a lot of honey i shrunk the kids there was just some something about it it had a honey i shrunk the kids vibe hmm. um, yeah you're sort of you're going around collecting supplies for your your base camp so they're like oh no we're out of water so you've got to go around and collect like dew drops somehow <laughs> uh, in your tank and then yeah you find these crackers and uh giant sort of cigarettes and things like that it's kind of yeah it's quite fun <laughs> cool. Oh, I should have to give your review a read, sir. Yes. Um, ha-ha. But yeah. Apart, apart from that, I have not really been doing anything interesting. Just gardening. <laughs> <laughs> well, before I went on holiday, uh, I got nearly completed the first Gears of War. So I thought, end of the current generation, I thought I'll try and finish off the Gears of War yeah. uh, mm. series. Because I played T3 and Judgment. So I thought I'd give one a go. And even yeah. now, although the data, graphics are a bit slightly dated compared to the recent ones, the gameplay still holds up exceptionally well, much better than even far more recent releases I've played. Just mm, it's a solid game. It's a very it? solid game. Mm. And uh, yeah, I was impressed how well it's held mm. up. It was one of the first games that I played on the Xbox 360, actually. And Because um, when I bought mine, I bought um, it came with Oblivion 
and Viva Piñata. But my friend had Gears of War, so we were sort of playing co-op around his house. And um, one of the things that blew me away was that, I don't know if you remember, but there's a, a level where you're out in the rain and you've got the sort of the wretches kind of um, coming out of holes in the ground. Mm. And the rain effects on that just blew me away. I was like, this is this is next generation. I'm in it. I, you know, <laughs> I've made it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that kind of really, for me, sort of set the standards for, for water effects in the current generation. Mm. That and Bioshock, isn't it? For, for me, water effects was Uncharted. Uh, yeah. PlayStation. But, uh, yeah, because it, it's cool. Because I also play in... Uh, on the way back, the in-flight entertainment was broken on the airplane, which was a right oh. pain. Oh. This is not what you want in a long flight. No, so I was no, a bit no. Professor Layton, uh, the time machine one. And yeah. Thomas was alone. Have you heard of that? It's sort of a was it Indiegogo or Kickstarter? Yeah, it won quite a few awards, didn't it? The BAFTA Game Awards. Yeah, so it got a few nominations at least. It's a platformer, and yeah. you play as like cubes or little shapes. One's a cube, one's a rectangle, one's like a, a giant cube and we all have different properties so one can jump higher and longer one can sort of bounce on things and just like all the different personalities and it's really platforming stripped back to such a simple level but mm. it's it's really good I'd recommend it it's it's quite cheap as well and it's on PlayStation Plus at the moment which oh. is why uh, yeah. you should go get that is it's it the one that's got really nice sort of um, narration over the top of it? Yeah, it's By got who's, famous man. Who's the guy who's in Assassin's Creed? He plays that the, the glasses chap. guy. Yeah, yeah. I Dan, can't Danny Wallace? Either. No, something like that. Yeah, I really? think it's him. Yeah, so oh, right. yeah, it's 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 a brilliant game. I'll definitely recommend playing that. Uh, I tell you what, um, I saw recently on the PlayStation Store, just because uh, you happened to talk about that. A friend of mine uh, got uh, Future Cop LAPD. Mm. Um, the old PlayStation 1 title, which I don't know if, if you're familiar with it, but it is one of the best games of that generation. It's kind of like you, you play as this um, kind of police walker, um, so like a robot that can also transform into a hover car. Um, and if that isn't <laughs> cool enough, people, you get, as well as the main campaign, which you can play cooperatively with a friend, you can also have um, a head-to-head mode, which you can play against either the computer or a friend, which is like a base capture mode, um, where you can take over turrets and um, spawn hover tanks and crafts of, of your own, as well as controlling your own walker. So I would I would heartily recommend that to anyone who's got an interest in sort of kick-ass kind of um, futuristic police walker games. I know it's a very niche genre, <laughs> <laughs> but the way I've described it, but I would definitely get that. Yeah, I do um, remember it. I was like, didn't play it. Yeah, I didn't play it. I was kind of, when you said it, I was thinking of, I think it was Siphon Filter I was thinking of, which was yeah. different again, wasn't it? Yeah, no, uh, Siphon Filter was like a, a third person action. Show. The main thing I remember about playing Siphon Filter is using the taser. To set um, people on fire. Yeah. I, was, I was just yeah. thinking that. <laughs> that was just dirty, wasn't it? Ah, memories. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, as well as that, I've been playing um, a free release on the PlayStation, which was um, there was actually a, a Tekken Revolution, which is the um, free Tekken game that they brought out. And, yeah, that's, that's not too bad. They've kind of, what they've done is they've kind of um, dumbed it down a bit and made it a bit arcadey. So you've got three or four attacks for every character are beefed up and made quicker. So people tend to sort of spam that quite a lot. But once you get used to that, it's actually not bad for a free, for a free game. And I think they keep adding new characters to it. Yeah, but you can and, purchase. Um, one yeah. One, yeah. And I know I should have a fight stick, really, but I kind of use control pads. And the 360 control pad, while being a, you know, my favourite controller for most things, just doesn't work for fighting games because of the D-pad, as I probably mentioned before. But mm. to, to be able to play Tekken on its... Because I associate Tekken with the PlayStation, so to be able to play it on its native pad with a decent, deep, you know, thing where I can actually play as uh, Kazuo Mishima and not have to worry about pulling off his uppercut, that that is, <laughs> yay! That's a joy. So cool. yeah, I've been playing that. Yeah, uh, bring on the Xbox One D pad. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've been. We've watched a few films as we've been back from holiday. Uh, mm. We've watched. Paranormal Activity 4 the other day. Did anyone watch that? I know Zara reviewed it back in October yeah. time. 
Mm. I've not seen it though. I can't remember that what whole kind of series sort of passed me by, but yeah, was it good? Yeah, I quite liked it. Yeah, it's mm. you wouldn't. There's no point seeing it if you're not a fan of the other yeah. ones, because uh, it is generally more of the same as mm. a, a lot of these sort of horror films. But they did use a few new cool techniques, with, like connect was right. implemented. Connect uh, was used. Really? Yeah, they use they. I don't know if it actually does this in real life, but if you turn connect Product on product placement, much a little bit. Yeah, uh, if you put <laughs> connect on, yeah. you put infrared on your like digital camera and record it. It has like all the dots all over the room to like to yeah. track the movement. I don't know if it actually does that in real life or if that's sort of. It, it does sort of. It does to your body. So your your hand will have a dot on it. Your elbow will have a dot on it your knees, so all your major joints will be dotted, and your head. Ah. So, uh, um, you, I don't know if it does it for, like, my sofa and stuff. It but yeah, this, in the, in the film, it, docks are projected over a whole room like a starry night sky, uh, yeah. and then, like, you can see people moving around here, but then you can see, like, a ghostly figure sort of Ooh. shift in the corner and things like that. So yeah, it was some cool uh, That's creepy, actually. I, I find mm. the Kinect creepy just normally, because you... When you're on the dashboard, I don't know if you guys have got Connect, but you get this little kind of grey, sort of weird image in the bottom right hand corner, like a picture in picture mm. of what the Connect can see. Ah. And sometimes it's really freaky. If you get really close to it and open your mouth, it sort of maps out kind of the hollow where your mouth is. You just look like a bloody <laughs> freaky zombie. <laughs> I, imagine, well, I have been I just think around your... a friend's house when when they've been using Connect, yeah. and um, there we had like a massive sort of gaming party, and every actually picked up you know it has a, the silhouettes of people mm. so uh it picked up like about 10 of us i think so it was all in that little window box down down the bottom it was like oh that's pretty cool but yeah, yeah. it looks like sort of slipknot or something's in your living room really <laughs> yeah weird. basically yeah <laughs> <laughs> rocking out but the thing about yeah. paranormal activity just to come back to that is that i always felt that um from looking at the trailers that i could sort of recreate it at home by just sitting in my attic with a little with the lights off and a bit of um, sort of infrared vision, not infrared, night vision goggles, and you know, kind of shaking a camera about at me. Um, so I never, I never felt that there was a real uh, tangible threat. But you're you're saying, Marty, that it kind of it, it is quite creepy, genuinely. Yeah, it, it is. It is quite well done, and the other sort of technique they use is uh, one of the main characters is like a sort of teenage girl, and she's on the computer with it at Skype. So she's chatting away to her boyfriend so uh, she can uh, talk That's to him and the guy have. can see the background of what she's uh, doing. So uh, you can see some oh, right. shift in the background again. Ooh. And again. See, that's the thing, isn't it? It's kind of, for me, it's kind of using our reliance in this generation on technology mm. um, and kind of turning it against you and using it as something you kind of fear, which is kind of, it's a cool idea. Yeah. There's too, there a bit too much technology. In our houses, probably, and it, you know, some of it can be open to misuse. I was reading last week in the newspaper actually about some new malware that they've introduced, which means that people can hack into your webcam on your PC and like watch you through it and do stuff. Ooh. It's really Gosh. weird. And there was some girl that was watching a film in the bath with her laptop, as you do. Maybe she had one of those waterproof things. I don't know. <laughs> um, and yeah, someone was watching her and filming her, and then selling footage of her in the bath oh, on the God. internet. Yeah, a well, whole be new careful, Marty. Next time, <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> yeah, that 3ds. You, they're going to be fetching. I don't think anyone will be buying that footage of me. Trust me. <laughs> top top dollar. That's going to be fetching, Marty, on the on the market. Yeah. Black market. <laughs> yeah, um, but anyway, what was that topic that you you brought up earlier? I, that we were going to talk oh, about. Oh yeah, uh, I, w- I wanted to find out what games got you into gaming. Um, do, you, do you mean to say I've got a whole yeah, list here? You actually. Hit, you kick it it's, off, yeah. It's, it's difficult to pinpoint it, but there's a mixture. There's things like the uh, Seventh Guest. I bet you remember clearly. Have you ever played the Seventh Guest? Uh, no. Uh, no. It's it's, it's uh, a puzzle game essentially in a haunted mansion. And I think it's one of the first games to actually have, like, people walking around. Like, what's it? Full motion video capture put into the game world. Oh. So you had, like, oh. ghost apparitions sort of wandering around. 
So that's a puzzle game. Uh, Lemmings. Ah, oh, Lemmings. That was hey. no, Total Annihilation. Command mm. and Conquer. Mm-hmm. Championship Manager 2. Mm. There's, there's <laughs> always a game that no one's ever heard is Detroit. Yeah, you keep mentioning talk about that. that yeah. And that got me. It's like a management game where you have to create a car industry. A car manufacturer, oh, really? yeah. Ah. It's uh, a real sort of unknown game on the whole. Like a, like a John Ford simulator? Something like that. Yeah. Was, was it a DOS game? Or? Yeah. That's the thing about the DOS. I, I'm, I was like, Henry Ford, sorry, I should say. Carry I on. was like one of these uh, monkeys that sort of are trained to do things. So they, monkeys get a banana and they press a button. So yeah, they get yeah. rewarded. All I did was on DOS, was typing like E code on forward slash theme, and I got theme park. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew if I typed that in, <laughs> theme park would load it's up. The Pavlovian uh, yeah, it's, training. It's, it's, just, I was conditioned. Yeah. Uh, I push this button, I'll play a game I like. <laughs> and like, I'd like Lion King as well. I mean Lion King. I'm sure it came with like eight floppy disks. Well, I had, I had the Lion King on the like the Mega Drive. That yeah. Was like the first game I had on the Mega Drive. I think it came with it, actually. It was like a Mega Drive special. But um, I don't know if it's the same version because they had a was it on the Mega? like a Master System version as well, didn't they? I I play. I remember borrowing um, uh, the Lion King. I felt, I I don't know whether it was my platforming skills weren't that great back then, but I found it quite hard actually. Bloody impossible uh, that game. There was a bit where you had to jump on um, giraffes' heads. Do you remember that? Yeah. And when you jump on them, they'd sort of flip you off in a different uh, direction. And uh, bloody tricky. You say like. Were the games harder? I know these games were generally harder because you didn't have a chance to save and do mm. load up and yeah. get your game progress through the game that way. But I remember thinking I got really far into some games, say like Abe's Odyssey, and then when oh. I came back to it as an adult, I thought I only got, actually got about 20 minutes into this game and played yeah. like the same 20 minutes over and over the child because <laughs> I couldn't get any further. I couldn't work out the first puzzle. Mm. Thought, oh. Abe's, Abe's Odyssey was a really good one, but that was actually really fiendishly difficult. I've tried again, like in recent years, and um, I did get a bit further, but I still, still like it was. You had to be so quick with the timing. Yeah. So you'd I have remember... to push a button and then jump up really quick to get out of the way of, you know, some rocket launcher or you know one of those paramites or whatever they were called that came after you. Yeah, yeah. They bloody... scared me. Uh, quite a lot of the things were quite freaked me out as a kid. Uh, yeah. What is it? They sold us like that. You know, like the, with the little, like, the little gun, yeah. gun kind of tentacle face soldiers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, like, I don't know remember the uh, the yeah, farting were, yeah. the game. Uh, yeah, farting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was my favourite thing, but I I couldn't get on with it at all. Like, I just found it too complicated. <laughs> I remember. Um, it. I, te- I, I tell you, Mike, the first as well. Mm. Sorry, Mike. No, I was, I was just about to say the first thing that I ever played. There was a volley, beach volleyball game on the Master System that came. I don't know if it came bundled with it or it came programmed on the Master System. I think that was the first game that I ever got competitive about, um, <laughs> and like really played it quite a lot. It's like a sport, uh, like a sports volleyball game, like really basic kind of graphics as you can imagine with the yeah. Master System. Mm. And the it's first like Sonic track game. and field kind of thing. Yeah, a bit like that, except stuck stuck on the beach volleyball pit, and that's it. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was one of those things where it was like, yeah, I got a spike. Uh, another point for me. Ha ha! It was, it was no I was dead or alive. Beach even even back then. then. No, no, it's not not up to the same standard though. But um, and the first Sonic game I actually played was a really shitty. Uh, pardon my French. Like L L C D, L no L E D game, um, that was on a handheld. That was kind of like a, a Sonic. I don't know if you remember this, but it was like a, it had its own. Um, the handheld itself had its own Sonic paint job, and um, right. you basically it was like a, a, a cheap knockoff of the actual um, game on the Master System, and it had um, a bonus stage where you had to bounce from side to side to get to the top to unlock the bonus balls that came down. Um, but that I played that game so much that I actually started to move my head side to side when I was playing it. Like my mum would say, "What are you doing?" And she'd see me sitting there with the, the thing in my hands, and I'd jump to the left and I'd move my head to the left when I jumped as well. I used to do that for platformers for like for years. 
But yeah, it's like with driving games when you move your hands. Yeah, and you actually like driving a car, moving the steering wheel. I still do that now, even as an adult. Sometimes. <laughs> you mentioned um, theme park as well. Yeah, um, I love theme park. I, I noticed there's a theme on my list. But most of them are puzzle or management games. Whether it's mm, management yeah. like theme park, Total Annihilation, Command and Conquer, like Lemmings, that's like the strategy. Yeah. And there's a Titanic game. Some Titanic game I played quite a bit as a youngster. Mum helped me with it at times. <laughs> it's like a puzzle. It's like you're on the Titanic and there's a bit of a mystery going around and you need to do all these sort of activities. And depending on what you do during the game, depends on the final outcome. And the outcome was always to me was I completely failed. I was supposed to rescue a painting or something like that down in the hold and it sank and I died or something like that. Uh It was a... You'll have to give it another crack sometime. Yeah, I'm able to do it now. (laughs) (laughs) Did you, um, speaking of management games, did you like um, sort of Dungeon Keeper? Oh, Dungeon Keeper. I used to be really into Dungeon Keeper. I love Dungeon Keeper. It's one of my favourite games. Which is yeah. why the only game I've ever backed on Kickstarter is War for the Overworld, which is essentially Dungeon yeah. Keeper 3. Yeah. That's, um, I'm looking forward to that immensely. I used to get to a certain level on Dungeon Keeper and then it would get really hard because the little dwarves would tunnel into your oh, yeah. dungeon and mess everything up. The... I never had time to collect the resources to fend them off. <laughs> what, I find, what I was saying earlier about finding games hard as a youngster... Uh, not sure if it was just because you're a kid and you're rubbish or because it is too difficult. But when I play completed games like Dungeon Keeper as a kid and then I just can't get past the mission as an adult with all the extra practical <laughs> now so I now possess. <laughs> and I just can't do some one of these one of the levels in Dungeon it's Keeper. Just, it angers, you're overcomplicating it maybe. It's kind of yeah, yeah, probably works both ways, doesn't it? But I was um, getting angry with it and I thought I did this when I was like eight and nine no, hang on, Dungeon Keeper came out what? 97, so I was 10. You have to remember, you had more free time on your hands then, though. It's mm. like it was, it's kind of one of those things where if you couldn't do something, you could just literally, through trial and error, play it again and again and again until you figured out but, how to get through. That, that is true, Michael, but the internet didn't exist then, so things like Games FAQ and Walkthrough on YouTube, they didn't exist, and I still can't do it. <laughs> oh, I was blind that's... as a kid, and now with all these guides to saying, oh, go as soon as you get start the level tunnel all over this direction get the gold in like the southwest corner and do all this mm. do all that and it's like I still can't do the bloody level it's true oh. I tell you on a slightly um, a diff- different note there's a game that I've always wanted to play it was slightly before my era because it's a text based game but it's um the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy text game is the one that everyone says is the funniest and the, be- the most uh, enjoyable to play um so I really want to get, you know, just a version of that if I can for my PC. But um, the thing that sold me was apparently there's an item in your inventory that you get in that game, which is called that thing that your aunt gave you, which you don't know what it is, but you can't get rid of. <laughs> and every, every, every time you get it, get it out of your inventory, it actually it comes back later in the game into your inventory and you keep trying to put it out of your inventory if it comes back. So it's just that kind of Douglas Adams style humour. Yeah. And it's the it's the only reason I would play a text based game if I could get something out of that that I couldn't mm. out of a normal game, which uh, with the humour is definitely the element that you know draws me to it. Otherwise, if you're playing a text based game where it's quite very serious and stuff, um, I might find that slightly boring. But yeah, maybe you could get it emulated. I was thinking of that. Yeah, yeah, there must be. Well, not that we say you can get dodgy copies off the internet, but obviously, I, I very uh, yeah. I find it very difficult to. I uh, think we'd be able to get a legitimate copy online, so there must be some mm. way to be able mm. to experience it. Oh. If there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. That's right. I don't, yeah, they won't be sending it in-game anymore. No. <laughs> That's for <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> Maybe a car boot set up for the yeah. one. But, well, my first game um, really was... Well, my first console was the Master System. Um, and built into the Master System was a game called Alex Kidd. Oh yes. Um, yeah. Do you remember that? It was like a really kind rock, of paper scissors, rock paper scissors. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it was a, like a Mario S kind of platformer, um, but you could do all kinds of stuff. You could ride a motorbike and you could swim underwater and stuff like that. So it's quite, it's quite a deep game, really. But um, yeah, the boss battles—that was, was a weird mechanic. Instead of actually fighting anyone, you had to 
challenge them to a game of rock, paper, scissors, <laughs> which <laughs> is nearly impossible if you don't really know what you're doing as a kid. So it's like, yeah, you could fail quite easily on the boss battles. <laughs> That's cool, yeah. So so that was your first console, was it? How old were you then? Um, I think I was... I don't know if it was my first console, actually. I had a Game Boy, the original Game Boy, so maybe... I don't know if I had that first or cool. second, but I got I got the Game Boy, I think, when I was four. I think maybe that was my first console. Because I played... Because I got the older brothers. Uh, I played them yeah. like the SNES beforehand. The first console that was mine, essentially, was for... The tenth birthday was at the N sixty four, and that was one of the oh. happiest days of my life when I looked on the bed and Mario sixty four was there. Oh, and, that was uh, awesome! Yeah, I remember Christmas. Yeah, got the N sixty four for Christmas one year, and um, I think it was when Zelda Ocarina of Time had just come out. So I think that was that was the first game that I got for it. I think and um, Shadows of the Empire, which was a really good Star Wars game. Um, which no one really seems to know about. Oh, no, I played Jedi Knight and a few other ones, mm. but I don't think I played that one. Shadows of the Empire was cool. You were, um, it was kind of set um, in between uh, Episode 5 and Episode 6, so Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Mm. Oh. Um, and you played like one of Han Solo's kind of dodgy, kind of bounty hunter type mates. Um, who had a similar ship to the Millennium Falcon, um, and you just kind of behind the scenes, kind of you helped out on the Battle of Hoth. You, it was essentially it was a third person kind of shooter, but there was quite a lot of vehicle elements, so you could fly, um, sort of the the ships in Hoth. You could do some of the Tie Fighter battles, and yeah, it was, oh, it was cool. really good. I I really liked to to see that sort of re-released actually. Yeah, my favourite. One of my favourite Star Wars games was uh, X Wing. Or well, no, Tie Fighter. Or was it X Wing uh, versus Tie Fighter versus X Wing? Yeah, or, one yeah. of them. Was that? I love yeah. I love that because I had the like, fused massive joystick on the PC and <laughs> going around piloting it is brilliant. I, but there's so few of those games around anymore. It's just like the flight simulators, mm. not the proper mm. Microsoft ones. Yeah, it's, it's a dead genre, isn't it now? It is, yeah, and it you know the the chances of seeing a another sort of Tie Fighter X Wing type thing with with Lucas Arts closure is quite yeah because now EA will be having to make it oh uh, yeah. they financially it doesn't make sense to them but at least there's a new Battlefront coming which uh, Battle- yeah oh, looks I heard yeah. about that and Frostbite Three that should be an immense game. Yeah, Full the last remember- from the eighty eighties the attacks collapsing <laughs> on. All the soldiers, like the little ATSTs running around, and all the ships it, flying in, and uh, it'd be immense. Look at the little, the cute little, little ATSTs blowing up my base. <laughs> and the, was it the Banthers, <laughs> like those Yeti feet things? Yeah, they got to bring them uh, in. The, um, the, you the, lose the, your Banther fighter, and then the, the, the Wampers as well. Yeah, Wampers and then stomping about. Take it to kill the Ewoks, like with <laughs> any sort of thing possible. <laughs> I quite like it. Doesn't matter how, just get the you, job done on those Ewoks. You got to become the hero, didn't you? And you'd be like Chewbacca or Darth Vader, just stomping around, just laying waste to hundreds of soldiers. That was great fun. Yeah, I tell you about the N sixty four. The one game I remember, and this is obviously probably going to be for a lot of people, is um, GoldenEye. Mm. Um, oh. The multiplayer sessions I had on that round, uh, my mates, is incredible. It's like um, you just start playing, it and the afternoon would just go. And it it would be you'd be like, where did that time go? That but that time was well spent. I have to say that it was it was some of the most enjoyable. It was the game that got me into first person shooters, really, if I'm honest, because I don't think I don't yeah. think I was very experienced with them before then. But it was we, uh, great. We were pretty blessed with Goldeneye. I think that was that was a special time in my life as well. Like me and sort of three friends would sort of kick back and yeah, as you say, just waste hours on it. I even managed to get my granddad into it. My granddad really enjoyed Goldeneye. Oh, he still talks about it now. He's like, Do you remember Goldeneye? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was a glorious game. <laughs> I, I, I did. I did love the game, but uh, I do wish because again, what was that ninety seven that came out? Mm. So yeah, uh, again, yeah. ten years old. I wish I would have been say eighteen, nineteen at university when you had so much free time in your hands with your mates <laughs> and a few beers. Just a few years older, you could really appreciate it that much more. Mm. Like, yeah, Perfect Dark as well. It came after that, where you had um, 
<laughs> multiplayer with bots mm. as well. Mm. Um, that was quite game. intense, wasn't it? I I never got as into the multiplayer to be honest, but the single player was was a pretty grand experience. Though. Mm. Um, yeah, there was a golden though. There was always some fiend that found a way back into the vent in facility. <laughs> Oh yeah, I, I, I did forget that once or twice. I remember that doing that. There was like a really specific button combination that you had to hold. It's like press the right button and spin to the left or something. Mm. Like, yeah, yeah <laughs> stand on the toilet. That's right. And then half the time you saw someone doing it, spinning round and round in circles. And then and then they got shot, and you got yourself a free kill. Yeah, uh, those were the days. It had like the magnum, so you could shoot through the door in the toilet and stuff. That was quite good. What was that gun that like couldn't hit anything for? Uh, like it was the club. Um, the club. The club. Club. There you go. <laughs> the club was like you just literally you could stand about four foot away from a caravan and let oh. loose a whole round with that, and you wouldn't hit it. Well, it it's like you... awful as well, didn't it? it sounded yeah. Like some sort of kind of wet mashed potato firing <laughs> implement. I don't know. Just That is possibly the best description of that gun I've ever heard. <laughs> really? It really, just... really was awful. Yeah. It was a shoddy gun. Yeah, mm. I've seen t-shirts recently actually with the club on yeah. it. It's like world's worst gun or something. I can't remember what it was. Mm. <laughs> My favourite gun was the uh, the Moonraker laser. Uh, oh, that was it. Infinite the, ammo. The RC90. Sort of black and white. Was that the orangey sort of. No. Yeah. That was the like machine gun, wasn't it? That was probably the best machine gun in the game in terms of accuracy and, and firepower. I like. Did it the... go through walls and stuff as well, didn't it? I... Did the RC ninety? Uh, I can't. It's like a power can't... weapon, wasn't it? I, think. I know the Magnum did. The Magnum I liked because that was like a. It really required skill to ta- get <laughs> from range to get a takedown with the Magnum. Is uh, mm. you're doing pretty well. Yeah. Have you, any of you played? Uh, the recent version of GoldenEye, because so I played it a little bit. I played the demo of it, actually. Yeah, it... it seemed alright, actually. I, I reviewed the the other the, the Legends. Uh, what was it called the Legends? Yeah, which was a bit naff to be honest. But GoldenEye seemed better. GoldenEye what, Reloaded. What the campaign was uh, mm. quite satisfactory, I'd say. It it mm. so it would have gone under the radar had it not had the GoldenEye name attached to it. It's a perfectly yeah. good game. Uh, is it like a re? Is it like a retooling of the original? Yeah, it is. It's got Daniel Craig. It's modern day, oh, no. and you know, say in the film, he uh, they go to this ship in was it Monaco, and when Urimov oh, takes yeah the, the frigate yeah, so sort of. that's now a in the new game a weapons and arms sort of convention in Dubai. <laughs> uh, you know the casino in Monaco where he first meets uh, Zena on the top. Yeah, that's now a nightclub in Barcelona. Oh. So it's sort of modernised it, sort of done that, got away with some of the gimmicky stuff. So you, it's the new Bond mine. It's gritty and serious. Yeah. So there's no, you know, when you're trapped in the train and you had to laser mm. off the locks. Oh, the little watch laser. Yeah, that's yeah. Just, like, you've got to shoot with locks off now. It's just realistic. Oh, what? oh come on. Well, don't don't watch be laser. messing with the watch laser, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, but, that's classic stuff. But, but, that was genuine tension, wasn't it? Because yeah. the watch laser was so crap. <laughs> like, it, but, I'm never going to get off this train. It was too easy, the new one. <laughs> but the biggest disappointment for me now was that uh, Valentine didn't look like Robbie Coltrane anymore. Oh, oh. Come on. that's a very specific... <laughs> Sort of criticism, but yeah, um, I did. I did like uh, old Robbie Coltrane in that. He was good value in the in the. Yeah. It was a golden eye movie. Is, is Sean Bean in it? No, they got the only likeness oh. in it is Daniel Craig's now James Bond. So there's no Judy Dench voices M, but she's nowhere yeah. to be seen. Other than that, it's all different voices, different faces. Yeah. But is there, a, is there an Alec Trevelyan character? Yeah, all the characters are the same. Uh, what was that right. game that came out where it was it was called Golden? It was like a called Golden Eye, um, or something. It was it was about the main character was a villain who actually had, had a golden eye. That was about two thousand and eight or something like that. An EA yeah. first person shooter, and because when yeah. I heard that the vi- it was called Golden Eye, the villain actually had a golden eye. I thought, I wonder how long it took them sitting around the conference table to come up with that peach. Of an idea, yeah, um, mm. that that was rather cynical uh, move. Yeah. Did, did, 
the Wii had a GoldenEye as well, didn't it? Was it Reloaded that was or Wii, GoldenEye? That was GoldenEye sort of was, same Is that one, the same version as the... Uh, okay. Just with like mm-hmm. more HD polish on the Xbox and PlayStation versions. But yeah. Yeah. Of, People do that all the time, don't they? They sort of trade on the memory of uh, an original good game and then try and flog a load of like uh, redone versions, some of which can turn out good, but most of which turn out like that. Yeah, well, um, some of them <laughs> work better because of the technical limitations at the time. It may, it it worked back then, but mm. it doesn't, yeah, something's doesn't just cut the mustard, does it? Because yeah. games, unlike, if you remake a film, uh, film quality is exactly the same as it was since the invention of colour and sound, say, sort of the 50s. Although te- uh, techniques um, have improved, but because of technology, you got slightly clearer pictures, but graphics yeah. have really expanded technology. Do you know what I mean? The quality yeah. in, of Casa- in the computer game world, the quality yeah, of yeah. Casablanca's film is as good as most recent blockbuster. It's still hard, oh, definitely. That, that's why you got Blu-rays of old 20s, 30s movies. Mm. Here's uh, looking at you in HD, kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's the difference. Well, films, uh, it, it is pointless doing films, and I can see why they do games, but the technical limitations and time made it sensible and okay. Whereas, like the HD remake of Silent Hill, it didn't work because. They added the fog because of the technical limitations of the PlayStation. Mm. Meant they had to add the yeah. fog. Cause you... And that was genuinely... I mean, and I only worked. played the demo, but that was genuinely the most scared I've ever been playing a horror survival game because <laughs> you had... Fun. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was the, it was the uh, limitations that were placed on your character. So you, you couldn't see very far. The only way you could... You had like a detector, didn't you, you mm. could, that went off. And the, the way it used sound as well. I'd never seen that in a game. So, you, you know, you kind of, you almost were fi- fixated on this de- uh, sort of monster detector, I suppose you'd call it. And um, yeah. just listening to it, boop, boop, it's, oh, it's getting louder, it's getting louder. Perfect tension, you know. Um, if you were a screenwriter writing a scene in a film, you'd pat yourself on the back yeah. uh, if you came up with yeah. something similar. It really was um, yeah, brilliant. True. But as as you say, my like the HD uh, the remake kind of... Uh, I didn't see the point of it, you know. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's well, that was a disaster. Let alone more mm. than a shame. But because mm. uh, you were quite quite heavy on that, weren't you? In your uh, criticism of it, because um, uh, your main what what were your main points again? I, it was a disaster. It, <laughs> Speci- <'cause> cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it basically. What didn't you like about it? It was awful. I don't know, but is it shame because? I loved. Uh, I didn't really play Silent Hill two, uh, mm. like when it came out, but I loved Silent Hill three, and that was immense. But uh, yeah, it's just I don't know what some people think sometimes when they think, oh yes, this is a quality product. Let's put it out. It's not like Silent Hill had a no fan base that we're going to not get to disappoint. It's thinking like one of those. Beloved franchises, I'm not beloved is the right word when it's a horror game, but you know what I mean. It's yeah. it's, it's held in high regard and I think quality control, sure I just thought it'd be better to jettison it than mm. like heart, a bit of a way through production I knew it was going to be. No fog meant, like, what's the point? In terms of, yeah, sort of, you know, graphically and mechanically, I think that's that's a fair argument. And... But what gets me is kind of going back to kind of the James Bond Legends game. Mm. The voice acting on that was terrible. And I just think, who in their right mind thought that that was a convincing Bond character? I know it's not voiced by Daniel Craig. It's meant to be Daniel Craig. But even little things, like he, the first time you sort of see him introduce himself, he says, names... James Bond. Oh yeah, I heard that. Yeah. It's like what? He doesn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> My name's James Bond. I'm sure, sure it goes Bond. <laughs> like James. So, they, so wait, wait a minute. Yeah. They had Daniel Craig's likeness, but they didn't have his voice acting. Yeah, and the same that, for a lot of a lot of the, the, the actors as well. So that's kind of messed up. Mm. It's really messed up. That, yeah. that, Did they yeah, have any of the older of actors? They had what Jaws in it and. 
Did they have they, anyone? They ha- Jules was in it, but he doesn't really say a great deal. Um, true to the films, they had Ob Job. Mm. He doesn't really speak either, actually. So yeah, you can kind of see where this is going. Um, Goldfinger, they had. Did they pick up Christopher Walken? Did that was his character in it? Scaramanga. No, that was Christopher Lee. What, the guy, what Max uh, Zorin, was wasn't it? Zorin uh, no, from, he, from he a, view a, a View to a Kill. A View to a Kill. No, that wasn't that wasn't covered that film. Mm. Mm. Um, so it was only certain films, and even in those films, the big moments in some of those films weren't even looked at. Mm. So it's kind of it's a weird idea, but yeah, I think you know the voice acting has to be taken into account as well. I well, considering how much money, Act- sorry, sure. considering how famous it is and how much money Activision have got, mm. thought, just give Daniel Craig like half a million quid, <laughs> and it yeah. immensely improves the the game. Yeah, but I just I do think sometimes that people can just get fat and bloated off you know just the James Bond name or you know or we'll call it Bond. People will still buy it. It doesn't really matter if it's a quality product. Yeah, you know, which is, our money's I mean, which safe is... in the bank. Which is sad, but true. Yeah, um, it is, it is sad. They will they will make sales off the back of a James Bond game, no matter how poor it how poor it is. It would have to basically be, uh, even if it was broken, I think they'd still get some money money back out of it. Um, but yeah, on a on a slightly better note, I, I, you were talking about Command and Conquer earlier, Mike, and mm-hmm. obviously you had the PC, PC version, didn't you? Yeah. Um, but I, I got into it through the, the release, the port that they had for PS1. So the original game plus uh, Red Alert, I believe, and Retaliation, which was the bonus pack, got ported to the PS1. And it was the first sort of strategy game that I really got into, um, aside from Theme Park for the Mega Drive, I think it was. And CNC, I remember first playing it and not even knowing how a construction yard worked. And it was like, <laughs> I was so excited when I got my, when I got my little base set up. Oh, it does that and oh look um so yeah it's been a it's been a long journey from there to owning the command and conquer saga mm. which is uh uh makes me sound uh icelandic every time i say that but no the <laughs> the kind of command and conquer saga um with uh, all, all of the different games on it but yeah I, I kind of um it's one of those series now when i look at it, i think actually the the single player campaign is a lot harder and requires a lot more strategy than uh, skirmish mode. Because mm. uh, skirmish mode is basically just about who who gets the first attack in and with the most weight of troops. But campaign mode, you put under certain conditions. So like you've got uh, a limited number of troops and you may have uh, enemy units that you've got to avoid and you know uh, explosive barrels to shoot in certain places. And mm. yeah, that... It was it was hard as nails. I remember uh, Red Alert particularly being hard as nails. Yeah, they weren't easy those games. Well, which is good. Mm. Actually, fair for the challenge, isn't it? That's how it should be. But it's good. Just thinking, like all these games we discussed, how uh, how far games come over the last like just fifteen years, really. It's mm. been pretty immense. And how we're looking at the PS4 with things yeah. like Watch Dogs and Assassin's Creed Four and all these other games coming out. It's, it's, yeah. it's a pretty exciting time still. Ex- it's an exciting time for arm hair enthusiasts, definitely. <laughs> and dirty nails. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah. although uh, some things... Although at least Microsoft changed the DRM policy on the Xbox One. That's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that shows that they're listening to the community, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. It Makes yeah. me think, are they listening to the community who are talking about the price? Will mm. that be the next thing that we see... Mm. Maybe they'll I think change they might, tact a bit. Don't know. They might have to be a bit inflexible on that one because mm. um, they the, the price is down to the fact that the uh, motion sensor, that the camera sh- whole shebang, is is built in. So unless they actually reverse that and the manufacturing decision uh, and bundle it separately, they aren't going to be able to nix the price. I don't think. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. That with the PS4. Mm. They but they haven't made it crucial like. To uh, the function of the Xbox One, not Microsoft have, although they could change that. So, uh, I it was mm, I mean, decision. I was thinking they could do like a an Xbox One Lite edition or something, which doesn't have the camera. But then I thought that doesn't really solve the problem of integrating the camera into all of the games and making the experience 
better, mm. I suppose, because everyone would just buy the you know the arcade equivalent or whatever. Mm. Um, so it, it just kind of exacerbates the problem. So yeah, I know I know what you mean. It's probably it's a hardware thing, isn't it? But, uh, mm. I, I read someone said uh, about the decisions for Microsoft to reverse. Uh, their policy, DRM, DRM policy. Yeah. So it makes Microsoft look weak. And I was thinking, would you rather them look strong and not change the policy? Mm. <laughs> I think, although it's I it's, a stu- yeah. it's it's not weak. It's it's a, they've been a bit silly and stupid. But I'd rather them be not. How can you say it's a weak of Microsoft? It's like, yeah, mm. let's it's, let's them be yeah. tougher out. Say, yeah, come on, we're going to stick with DRM. We're going to double the price. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah screw you, gamers. gamers. <laughs> so, uh, That's really we, hard. we hate our audience. <laughs> We're going to do everything possible to make their lives horrible. Yeah, um, no, I, I um, don't consider it weak, really. I, I consider yeah. it, you know, a company that probably should have done more market testing in the first place and figured out actually what people wanted. Mm. But having said that, you know, they know now and they've kind of listened, which is, I don't think listening is ever a weakness. Yeah, Anything, it's I think that's a strength. Every company... Yeah. I don't think we should let. Ups. I don't think we should entirely let them off the hook. Um, mm. We we should obviously look. The fact that they've um, listened and acted on what they've heard is commendable. But I don't really think they had a choice. I think they were put in an impossible position uh, by Sony. Uh, I think they would have looked completely. They would have been dead in the water, basically, in terms of the most of the market. I don't think they would have lost their hardcore following, mm. but a lot of people would have got turned off if they didn't reverse. Everything they were made to uh, look stupid, by that, especially yes. by that video. It says, Did you see the one like how to uh transfer your games to your mates or something like that? Did you see that just, video? Yeah, you just handed yeah. it, hand it over. <laughs> yeah, I know it was brilliant. They were made to look so stupid, and it's yeah. It's, Having said that, playing devil's advocate, I, I, as much as I enjoy. Um, rubbing it in people's noses when they've made a mistake. Well, yay for rubbing it in people's noses when they've made a mistake. Um, Sony, the, the air of smugness that came from the Sony, prob- <laughs> you could probably you could probably smell the waft of that smugness from about fifty miles away. Yeah. Just the you know the guy doing the the presentation just couldn't help having this really smug grin on his face when he's talking about it. And as much as I wanted to get behind him and say yeah no I agree with that, I was kind of almost put off by it. Yeah. It seems, yeah, it's a, it seems a little bit, there's a bit of a, a deviousness to it, I suppose, isn't there? It's kind of like, well, yeah, we've got one over on you. Mm. And it's it's that kind of mass rivalry, isn't it? Where yeah, it's, well, it's almost like Microsoft, no one comes out of it particularly well, because Microsoft obviously made a bunch of stupid decisions that they then had to reverse. Yeah. And then Sony kind of danced around on the yeah. mess. And said, "He he, look what you've done." Um, so yeah. they, they both come out as rather as being a childish and um, b um, not really that you know uh, relatable. Uh, yeah, and as a consumer, I don't feel oh, you know, Sony have done all that stuff because they want to please me as a consumer. Mm-hmm. I kind of would feel like mm, they're just doing it to get you know the upper hand on Microsoft. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not the way to well, run business. <laughs> on that note, uh, I think we'll leave it there, chaps. Okie doke. This male okay. dominated podcast. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah, it's an uh, exciting time still. Looked at some old games that got into gaming, and uh, hopefully, lots of games to come still for the next 10 mm. years for Microsoft and Sony, and whoever else might get in if Apple could get in the next few years, possibly. Yes. Yeah. Could they release in set top box? Yeah. Maybe. Could be. be exciting times. They're supposed to release a new product this year, product line. So you yeah. never know. Maybe Nintendo will do a, a decent console in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, hey, uh, guys. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So uh, anyway, so it's goodbye from uh, myself, Martin, and it's goodbye from James and Michael. See you guys. Bye-bye.